Good morning and welcome to Grand Rapids Women and their work during the Great War. My name is Kimberly McKee and I am the director of the Coochie Office of Local History. The Coochie Lo Office of Local History is housed in the Brooks College of Interdisciplinary Studies at Grand Valley State University and our mission is to give voice to diverse communities through history. We do so through a variety of projects and programs, one of which is the annual Local History Roundtable. Today's presentation, Grand Rapids Women and Their Work During the Great War, closes out our 12th Annual Local History Roundtable Leading the Charge for Change webinar series. If you're familiar with the Coochie Office, you know we usually have a day-long set of events in March, but this year, because of COVID-19, we've brought it brought it to you virtually through a series of three different presentations. We're really excited about Caitlin Vermaris today. This presentation is being recorded. That recording will be up on our website and our YouTube channel later this week. Uh, please comment in the Q&A if you have questions for our speaker. Please note that we will not get to all audience questions, uh, but we will try our best. Um, and so thank you so much. And I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Caitlin Bosch Vermaris, is the director of, of Zealand, the Zealand Historical Society. She received a BA from Calvin College and an MA in public history from West Virginia University. She has worked with many West Michigan topics, including Grand Rapids women's roles in the Council of National Defense, the 1918 suffrage movement, and the cultural integration of Hispanic people into Holland, Michigan. Vermaris also works as a freelance researcher and writer and is recording secretary of the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council. So if you can join me in welcoming Caitlin, I'm so excited to listen to your presentation today. Thank you, Kim. I am just sharing my PowerPoint here for you all. getting that going. I thank you all. I am so excited to be here. This research is something I've been working on for a couple years. Um, and this is just a part of, of um, what I've been looking at is women's labor during World War I at home. So I am very excited to be here today to share this research with you. Um, just a caveat I'm sharing, just so you all can feel my pain. I lost a lot of my notes last night in the computer crash. So I rewrote a lot of it this morning and last night. So if there's some um, awkwardness where I'm trying to figure out what I wanted to say, I apologize for that. So um, today we're talking about women and what they did at in Grand Rapids during World War I. We're gonna start with some national context and then we'll move through the specifics of how women organized to assisted labor, um, both the volunteer to, and also um, the work that they actually did. So um, for some context, we're gonna um, first talk about the gender division of labor. So for much of history, there was a sense of what was women's work and what was men's work. And there was a highly gendered understanding behind that. Um, most of the paid work was men's work. So women's work um, was often seen as an extension of their duties and their sense um, towards the home. So women's responsibility was to take care of the children and the home. So any paid work they did um, had to be an ideological extension of that. Um, so when we talk about the type of work women did, a lot of times there's um, maternalistic tones beneath it. Um, one, of, one of the phrases that scholars use to talk about this work is called pink collar. So as women expanded into paid labor, um, a lot of times it was in beauty industry, nursing, or clerical work, or other types of work that was an extension of that maternalistic instinct. Um, so this work often demanded basic education and literacy, um, but it still fit within the idea of women's roles. So that's where you get, um, we'll talk a lot about clerking and business. Um, there still is a sense, you still need some education to do that. You still need to be a um, good worker to do that. So um, there's also in history, um, a hierarchy for women and what sort of roles that they did. 
So white American women um, were a lot less likely to work. And if they did, it was more likely to be in skilled positions, such as teaching or clerical work that required some um, additional schooling. If they were married, they were extremely unlikely to work before the war. Many European immigrants uh, worked in factories when they arrived. And if they were single, they were also unlikely to work after they were married though. Um, however, they were more likely than American um, natu naturalized American white women to contribute with income in other ways, such as taking in borders or taking in laundry to do at home, things like that. African American women were more likely to be in the domestic or unskilled fields. Um, African American wives, so married women, were eight times more likely to work outside the home than white married or other um, racial groups. There is also, um, this was because African Americans in general were paid less, so their husbands were earning less. So both um, the women often needed to work to contribute to the family. And so still kind of an extension of their duty to their family. Um, less than 2% of women in the national, na in the um, census in 1910 worked in skilled positions. So um, they were more likely to be domestic workers or agricultural than teachers or clerical work. Um, this graph shows US female labor participation in 1890 to 2005. So it goes way past the time frame we're talking about. But I think it's helpful to show the um, broad scheme of what we're talking about for women's involvement in the labor force. So from 1890, there was 18.2% of women who participated in paid labor. By 1910, that number was 24.8%. So there was a gradual increase in women's paid labor um, since the 1890 census. And part of this is due to the industrial revolution, which created more um, clerical and unskilled positions that women could do. And also um, the typewriter was developed in the 1880s. So um, that created a need for women typists, and that was often something that women would be hired to do. Um, so as you can see, in 1920 and beyond, there is still um, very gradual growth. So it's something we'll talk about at the end, that um, there was a growing trend between 1890 and 1940, but the real increase in women's involvement in the labor market doesn't come until after 1940s and 50s. Um, one thing we'll, we'll talk about during World War I though is the type of work that women were doing was different than it was before 1917, 1918. So women would, um, they'd continue to concentrate in lower paying unskilled positions and men would fill the higher paying industrial jobs such as mining, transportation or heavy industrial work. Um, but they did start to do some of um, the work in those fields. But as we'll talk about, it was still seen as men's work that the women were doing. So as uh, Laura Hubert was a woman from Grand Rapids and she wrote that she was doing men's work in the machine department at Kendall Bed Company. She was there as a woman doing the man's work. The idea that it was man's work didn't change. So jumping into the actual war, um, once the war began, wartime conditions demanded some attention to the labor structure because there was a draft and there was a need for wartime production, both agricultural and industrial. So the government um, looked at to women as a solution to fill some of those gaps. So on April 6, 1917, Woodrow Wilson declared war. Immediately, um, he started building a structure that would rally private enterprises to reach that wartime capacity. So the idea was he would create a, um, an organization, a federal agency that would oversee these private, local and state enterprises um, to do the actual work. So he formed the National Defense Council um, to do that. Um, suffrage leader, Anna Howard Shaw advocated for a women's committee for that. And she served as the president of that. Um, this, the framework for this was the same as um, the, the, the National Defense Council. 
So they recruited leadership by working with existing charities and volunteer associations. And so they created a leadership of white middle-class women who were already involved in the progressive reforming um, committee work that was already happening at the time. So it, um, you found people who already had an in with the community to organize the women there. Another vehicle was the Women in Industry Service. This was formed as a federal agency. This agency undertook a survey of working conditions for women. They, want, they were concerned about if women entered the workforce, would they be treated fairly? Would they have safe conditions? Um, would they be paid well? So this, this survey found that women were not being paid the same. They're being paid consistently less. So they had this slogan they developed called equal pay for equal work. The concern for this was that if women were being paid less, then men would come in and they would still pay the men what they're paying the women workers. And they didn't want to affect the ability of their husbands to earn what they had been earning um, by taking their place. Other protections advocated for was the eight hour workday, um, safe working conditions, not having hazardous chemicals, not having large machinery that was unstable. So in Grand Rapids, when you look through the material from the time, you can see that the war permeated everything. Um, this was very visual when you look through the papers. The Grand Rapids Herald is a local morning paper and the Grand Rapids Press is a local evening paper. So this was the subject of news articles, advertisements, wanted ads. You can see it throughout the whole paper. And the Grand Rapids Herald also printed a column every day, which was devoted to women's work in the war. And every Sunday, they ran a full page spread, both sides, um, that was called Grand Rapids Women and Their Work in the War. So these pages or these articles praised the work of women around the city and showed other ways that women could get involved if they weren't already doing war work. So headings included um, the faithful workers for Uncle Sam and the one on the screen, if you were a cherry, would you fall into the basket for women who were picking cherries? Um, Faithful workers for Uncle Sam, side note, Uncle Sam was developed as propaganda during World War I. So rhetoric um, in these articles aimed to empower women. They showed factory work, they showed farm work, they showed women doing the same work as men. A personal favorite of mine was an advertisement that was for folly kidney pills, and it claimed, quote, women are braver than men. Women often do tasks at home office or factory while suffering pain and misery that would put a man in bed. The Grand Rapids Press and Grand Rapids Herald used the word work interchangeably to talk about volunteer work and wage earning work. So we're focusing primarily on paid work, um, but volunteer organizations were also concerned with paid work um, and did a lot of advocacy around it. So one of the largest visual indicators of the changing labor um, lines were women in overalls. So the focus of women's clothing in the publicity of war shows that this was a novel thing. Um, women were still serving in a segregated workforce and they were still limited to certain roles, but they were wearing men's clothing while doing it. And that created a visual excitement and also some concern. So an article published in April of 1917, said that overalls are not just for European women. They have made their way to Grand Rapids. Another article explained that in many factories, women workers discard skirts and bloomers for overalls, thus ensuring greater ease and freedom for work and minimizing any danger from machinery. So this was also essential attire for some. So there was an advertisement that said, wanted girls bring overalls. So similarly to overalls, there was some stir around women in uniforms, especially Red Cross and nursing uniforms. So these were also visual representations of women expanding some of their traditional roles in the labor force. There was also information on how to make your uniform more attractive and feminine. Um, and so something to keep in mind too, so there, we talked about women in factories um, and entering some of the munitions fields and railroads. And even if I don't touch on that, this was still things that were um, permeating the newspapers and what people were reading. And it still caused a stir 
too, even though definitely women were wearing overalls and uniforms and gun outfits as well. So now we're gonna jump into some of the work uh, that was taken up during the war specifically. So first of all, we're gonna talk about some of the volunteer organization around labor. So this, um, the Grand Rapids Division of the Women's Committee of the Council of National Defense, it gets kind of wordy as you start talking about the local regions, um, undertook this huge registration campaign. This was the largest undertaking of the committee. The Michigan Division worked, worked for months to promote this campaign. Um, they did a promotional video with the governor, who was Albert Sleeper, and signing the proclamation for the registration campaign. They hung posters and storefronts, they handed out flyers on the street, they went to churches, they went to um, factories to talk about it. They trained over a thousand registrars to interview women and record their information for this registration. Women over 16 could register, any woman over 16. In Michigan, they did register over 900,000 women and in Kent County, over 23,000. And we actually still have those cards at the Grand Rapids Public Library and they're digitized. Um, well, the registration campaign was not actually to do com compulsory labor. It was to get us a survey of what skills and interests there were in the community so that they could pair people with war needs. Um, so they were very clear in their communication of when you register, we're not going to draft you. It's not the same as what the men had for the draft. After they launched the campaign, um, they put stations all over the city to register women. They did special attention to women in factories. Um, and they, they had the goal of placing women in the war work. This, um, the flyer on the screen was one of them um, was a popular flyer that they used, the spirit of women power. Women, serve your country where you can register. So um, registration was tied with patriotism a lot of the same way that Uncle Sam and other propaganda um, tied to patriotism. If you're patriotic, you will register. The um, Grand Rapids leader was Grace Ames Vithausen. She sent registrars to factories before the registration campaign was underway. Um, she said of um, the campaign to send women to factories, quote, the eagerness of factory girls to register for war service should be an inspiration and an example to women in all walks of life. In the first week of registration, there were 1,700 women who were enrolled from 30 different factories, 10 of whom, 10 factories of whom enrolled 100% of the female laborers in their, in their facility. Van Helsen also chaired the Grand Rapids Division for Equal Suffrage Association. And this was pivotal in advancing women's suffrage, which women got in 1918 as well. So this is an example of what the card looks like. Um, at the top, you see biographical information, their name, their address, their race, their country of birth. They also gives room to talk about what type of service they want to offer and how much time they can give. It also records their occupation and where they're employed. Um, so there's just a ton of information here about women. It's, it's a really good survey of um, women in Grand Rapids at the time. It also has 116 potential skills that you can either mark um, or say that you currently have or say that you want. Um, and we will talk about some of the trainings that they did for women who marked that they wanted certain skill sets to be developed. So the public library is working on getting the metadata for this all, um, all cleaned up, which is something I'm very excited about because the data I think shows um, this really comprehensive look at what women were like and what they were involved in and where they lived and all sorts of information um, during that time frame. So some um, work that I did in regards to labor was to look at um, what type of fields were women in Grand Rapids working in? We have national data, but what about the local data? Um, so about 52%, a little over 50% of women marked their occupation as housewife. Um, there were also women who said they were unemployed. And um, I think that's an important distinction because the, a lot of women identified their occupation as 
my job is to be at home and take care of my family. Um, of the other women who did identify some sort of paid occupation outside of the home, this is where the chart is about. So I, I was interested in what type of work were the women who were getting paid to do work doing? Um, so the number one area was business, which I realized later clerking probably would have been more appropriate. So this includes stenographers, telephone operators, bookkeepers, um, the type of women that you think of as, as um, helping clerk for a business. There were some who were um, some higher positions, but not enough to section those out. 18% identified as working in some sort of industrial capacity. So a lot of these were in industries that still seem to be an extension of women's roles. So there were a lot of women at Globe Knitting Works or um, industrial laundry facilities or canning companies or candy companies, things that were in food and clothing um, and industries that seemed a little more intuitive for women. There were 66 women who identified as four women uh, or four ladies. So they were there were some women who were managing other women. 11% um, were sales and retail. So this would be from your big department stores to your family shops. They handled um, marketing and selling and, and um, managing the cash register, et cetera. 10% were students, which if you think about the 16 age cutoff, that makes sense. 9% worked in education. So this was a lot of teachers, some music teachers, art teachers, elementary teachers. There were some who were in administration as well. 8% were domestic workers, um, housekeeping, boarders, things like that. Some women who identified as house or as um, homemakers or housewives also mentioned they'd taken borders too. So some of those were still classified under housewives, depending on what they listed first. Um, then 5% were in clothing and beauty, which is kind of a category I made up as women who take care of the appearance of other women. So these are seamstresses and hairdressers and manicurists, things like that. 3% were in the medical field. A lot of these were nurse, nurses or assistants, um, but there were a couple physicians, about five. And we also know from the Grand Rapids Press that these women organized to specifically donate and raise money for the war effort, the position. 6% um, were either unoccupied, unemployed, or miscellaneous. So what I think is great about local history is you have statistics and trends, but there's also these individual stories. And they were some women who didn't fit in any of these categories. So there was a detective, um, there was a pension attorney, there were two who were undertakers and there were about 60 women who were in some form of printing or publishing and a couple of journalists. Um, a brief look also, I'm trying to sort through with when women who identify their race as non-white, um, what sort of occupations were they doing? So this, um, there's a race category and a country of origin I did not grab anything from the country of origin. So there could be other women such as Dutch, I know that were in there um, that, that aren't captured here, but this is all the women who identified a race that wasn't white. And there were a number of cards that didn't have any race identified. Um, something interesting, a couple interesting insights from this chart. Of the 15 Polish women who are listed, there was only one um, that did not work at the same cigar factory as the other 14 women. They all worked at the exact same cigar factory. Um, if you look at women in the home, in the fourth category, there are 30 out of 100, which is significantly lower than the, um, whole, the whole data, which was just over 50%. Um, and if you look at black, the Black women, there are 25 out of 57 who were in the home. And those were all married. Um, so, so when we talk about our national data, that does seem to have some reflection here on some of the local data as well. Another note, um, there was some prejudice against German women in the papers about how women, German women were particularly expected to register um, because their patriotism was in doubt. Um, so we're gonna talk more, dive into a little bit more about some of the specific 
areas where women were working. So um, clerical positions was number one. Um, there was a prominent growth area, and this was actually an area that the uh, Women's Committee identified as a high need area where they need more people. And it's also the only area that didn't decline sharply after the war. So women tended to stay in these positions. Um, Women's Committee worked to expand employment opportunities by working with the Board of Education. So they offered classes on office work, um, telegraphy, typewriting, nursing, housekeeping, and home economics. And Van Housen also oversaw the establishment of an employment bureau. And um, they also had a, co a course on motor, the motor course. So they had 25 women enroll to learn to drive. Learning to drive was something that was often expressed as a high um, desire in the cards. Women were also farming, which didn't show up in terms of explicit occupation in the cards. However, 10% um, of women did identify farming as a skill in the cards. Um, so many of these women grew up on farms or were needed occasionally to run their family farm. Um, farming was not received everywhere in some of the national data. I found some um, high opinions that women shouldn't be farming, but it seems in Michigan that there wasn't as much of an issue with that. At a state conference for the Women's Committee, there were 90% of the delegates that said that they'd be willing to assist with planting and harvesting. Nursing was also a prominent need area identified. Um, the, the need for nursing was not only to go overseas, which a lot of women who already had nursing certificates were asked to do so, but to train them to fill vacancies at home. Um, so women were there, were, there were a lot of women who expressed interest in training for nursing. And Mrs. Blodgett, who was the wife of John W. Blodgett, who's the founder of Blodgett Hospital, campaigned for two weeks to recruit women for training. And she also founded the Vassar Camp, which prepared over 40 women uh, for a nursing career. And this is something that they could take with them after the war. In Michigan, there were 1,070 women, which was not counting Detroit, who applied for the nurses drive, which was a process for nurses to receive training um, and to enter the nurses reserve. By July of 1918, there were 60 nurses from Grand Rapids that had enrolled in the nurses reserve. Most of these were single, but there were a few young wives who, um, whose husbands had gone overseas, so they were unoccupied. I also found an article in the, in the Grand Rapids Herald that talked about a nurse who died in action from Grand Rapids overseas. So of course, we're also gonna talk a lot about industry. Um, this chart shows the number of women in factories in Michigan across different time periods. So you'll see gradual growth um, between 19, or 1894 and 1910. And then there's a large leap um, going up to 1918. So in 1915, there were 65,700 women who had registered as factory workers in Grand Rapids, and they had earned an average of $1.30 a day. More than 55 factories opened up hiring applications to women in 1917, 1918. Um, and in 1918, it was estimated that 20% more women were working in factories than before, than a year before, than in 1917. So some women also received training for supervisors, like we saw with the four women, the four women identified, four ladies, I guess, sounds better, um, to oversee other women and also gain a little bit more money. There was also um, instances of teachers who decided to work in factories over the summer, such as the Sly Furniture Company, um, and when men left those positions to earn a little bit more money during the summer. Companies like the National Biscuit Company posted several aver separate advertisements for women and men in the same paper to make it clear that they wanted um, to fill both positions. So there were some women who um, saw this as an opportunity for women to prove their mettle. So there's a, a writer in the Grand Rapids Press named Katie Suffragist who, um, probably a pseudonym, who wrote, quote, well, women in factories are doing hard work in unbecoming garments. Their nails break. They are tired when night comes. Women take pleasure in earning their daily bread. And there were a lot of women who talked about love, liking their jobs. The, Helen Wagner was a elevator operator who said she really enjoyed it. Um, Katie Suffer just also wrote, however, that 
she doesn't want a man's job. She wants a job. She doesn't want to demolish the home. So again, you see this tension between wanting to um, grow in your opportunities, but also maintaining the family structure. Another emphasis, um, as we talked about nationally, was making sure that women had safe conditions when they enter the factories. So local labor unions worked with the women's committee to form sub a subcommittee on women in industry, which was, um, which was chaired by Grace Ames Van Housen, like we talked about. The National Women in Industry Committee, which was led by Agnes Nestor, advocated for women to fill only necessary positions and mothers with children should not um, fill those positions. This agenda again reinforced that um, they wanted to maintain traditional gender roles while preparing for the war. The committee rallied around equal pay for equal work locally as well. Um, the wages for women in the factory did increase from $2 to $3, so it seemed to work. The subcommittee conducted a full investigation in Grand Rapids in addition to the national investigation. And um, they did successfully reduce um, hours from 60 to a legal limit of 54 hours. So, and this demonstrates an interest um, from the middle-class reformers and the volunteer positions in working conditions for women as well. Move forward. So I, I stole this information um, on Berkey and Gay from a fellow board member on the Women's History Council, Julie Taber, who works at the public library. She did some specific look at what um, Berkey and Gay, the furniture factory, looks like. Um, in the summer of 1918, Berkey and Gay, like many industries, had a shortage of skilled workers as men were being drafted. So women went to recruiting stations to apply, like the one pictured. Reports would later say that there were fewer accidents when women worked in furniture factories and fewer infections. The chart um, on the bottom, or on, on the left here, shows that um, there was a huge jump in women working in Burkina Gay in 1918 and 1919. In 1920, there were 121 women employed. Um, and that in 1918, there were 15% of the factory. So one of the things to consider uh, when you look at a factory like this is that there are both skilled and unskilled positions and there are clerical positions and there are industrial positions. So she was able to find from a list of birthdays in the, new, in the factory newsletter, which um, positions the women who were employed held and create the graph on the right. So there were 29 women who worked in the office in some capacity. They did bookkeeping, transcription, and other administrative tasks. There were 75 to 80% who worked in factory or labor type positions. And even within this, there's some variety in terms of skilled or unskilled labor. Um, there were three, four ladies who were in charge of the others. And so the helper position would be a lower type position um, on the shop floor. The majority of the women in the, women in the factories though were sanders or rubbers. Um, I thought it's interesting just to look at how one factory um, dealt with the insurge of labor and what that looked like at that one factory. So while women had been working in businesses, factories and other roles seen as man's work, um, this did raise question even at the time about the future of women's work. So some speculated that women would return to their household work. They would marry their soldier sweethearts and um, they would, they, things would go back to normal. Others thought that once women get a sense of economic freedom, uh, they would want to continue on the job. There were a lot of editorials that went back and forth on this issue. As we've talked about a little bit, the data shows that um, in terms of volume, it didn't necessarily increase how many women were in the labor force after World War I. And the Michigan Labor Bureau statistics showed that in 1917, there were 1,155 women employed in Grand Rapids. In 1920, that number grew to 6,504. Um, but then 1920 report um, going forward, it did go down. 
so I want to spend the last couple of minutes talking about implications for this and why it matters. Why do we care about what women in Grand Rapids were doing during World War I? One of the reasons is that a similar mobilization would occur on a grander scale during World War II. Um, and as we, if we, the first chart that I showed showing uh, all the way to 2005, some, that did stick. Um, women in the labor force did increase after 1940s. Also, this was on a large, um, a larger scale because the war went on longer. Um, so of course I have a picture of Rosie the Riveter who is a World War II icon for women entering factories. And it also, um, it created a template for what that looked like. Um, and it showed that because women had done it before, they can do it again. Also, um, women should, like I said, women had done it before, so they could do it again. So um, the secretary of the Grand Rapids Association, Association of Commerce, whose name is Lee Flairs, said, quote, women offer the solution to the labor problem. They're efficient workers. They aren't as ready to complain. They're steady, they're hard workers, and they do the job as well as men. And what I think is significant, and I touched on earlier, um, in 1918, women gained the right to vote in Michigan, and this was just about, I think, 10 days before the war ended, women were granted the right to vote in a referendum. Um, and one of the reasons they used in arguing for the right to vote was the work they had done in the war. So you see the graphic there, the right to vote as a war measure. This is all the ways on the left women are serving. All they want in return is enfranchisement. Here's some more graphics that just show some of the rhetoric that um, talked about how women earned the right to vote because of what they did during the war. Though Equal Franchise Association had a huge campaign um, while they were also doing the war work, it was happening simultaneously to get um, men on board. And one of the men they got endorsement from was the governor, Governor Sleeper. And he did, he also cited war work as an important reason why women had earned the right to vote. And he called upon their sacrifice in giving up their sons and husbands for the war and why they should have a voice in their future. And of course that on, on a national level, just two years later in 1920, um, the 19th amendment would pass giving women a right to vote nationally. Um, and a lot of historians will say maybe the 19th Amendment wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for the contributions of women during World War I. Um, so my last slide here is just some, you could say recommended reading, um, some of the national or the, the contextual sources I used and found to be very helpful. The big one is the second line of defense, American women in World War I by Lynn Dumanel. That's um, really some groundbreaking work in a book that came out in 2017 and um, very interesting. Um, there's a couple more. Women, War and Work talks about specifically women laborers during World War I. And then David Kennedy's book over there, over here, uh, The First World War in American Society, talks about how propaganda was used and how um, he argues that World War I created a propaganda state. And it talks about how um, some of the ideologies played out in the messaging and rhetoric from the national government. And of course, the women's registration cards on the Grand Rapids Public Library website. If you knew anybody who was in Grand Rapids, if you have an ancestor, a great grandmother or grandmother, um, you should go to their website and look them up and see if you can find the card. It's a truly spectacular resource. So that's all I have for now. Any questions? Caitlin, um, thank you so much for such a great presentation. Um, while you quickly stop your screen share or um, actually, you know what, I can, perfect. Um, I, I do have some questions just as a reminder to our attendees, please feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A box. Um, I know we received one um, and I was just gonna pop a link to the uh, digital collection um, uh, from Grand Rapids Public Library of the Women's Committee of Council of National Defense Cards if people wanna check those out. And I also just wanna highlight the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council um, website too, uh, which mentions those same cards. 
Um, so that is also in the chat. Um, additionally, if you did join us late, welcome, pleased to have you here. And note that we are recording this webinar and that it will be up on our website and YouTube channel later on this week. Um, and so again, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. And it's so funny. I mean, I guess not funny is probably not the right word for it, but I was, my first question for you actually, Caitlin, was going to be what resource research sources were the most helpful. And then you ended your presentation there. So thank you so much for that. Um, yeah. so I, I guess my first question is a little broad, but I was just curious, was there anything that you found in researching sort of this particular topic that surprised you? Um, I, I think I was surprised at how, um, to be honest, I was surprised at how well the local data fit the national data. I had expected it to be, um, to be some more variants. I don't know why. I just always think of localities as, uh, as being specific. And they were, like I talked about, there were some specific women with, um, very differing and unexpected type of positions. Um, but when I when I'm compiling some of the the local data, it just it fits so perfectly within what you hear from the national data, um, which was kind of which was surprising to me. <laughs> well, I think oftentimes, right, we're to see where that local history piece fits in. I really appreciated you mentioning um, the importance of local history and providing that broader context. Mm -hmm. So just thinking about um, uh, news articles and that kind of thing to sort of flesh out what was seen in these um, women's defense cards. Um, and right. so I'm curious then too, did you, have you come across in terms of the Grand Rapids context or West Michigan context at least about how this, how this kind of work um, impacted uh, women's um, family or interpersonal relationships at all? Yeah, um, there were some instances in the cards um, just looking through them individually where you see women saying my husband doesn't want me to serve or my husband doesn't want me to work um so that was you definitely have those those family relations impacting how much they were willing to work or to serve in some sort of volunteer capacity um you also see women whose husbands have gone overseas who were wanted something to do and were excited to do to do something um and yeah, you see editorials on both sides too um, about whether women should be working or not. But those, so looking at the individual cards does show you a lot how the interpersonal relationships impacted. Also, um, something I didn't talk about for the registration campaign is they went into schools um, and they did projects with the kids. So they, in the high schools, they had a speech project where you argued um, for women or for the war, talking about the war. And then they told the kids to go home and get their moms to come register. Um, so there was an account of an elementary school kid dragging her mom by the hand to the registration booth to register. <laughs> so they definitely engaged the whole family as well. Oh, wow. That's, I think, really wonder or interesting to think about sort of how we, they engage school age children to really try to encourage um, sort of broader labor participation. And then I, I, throughout your presentation, you touched on the experiences of Black women. And I'm wondering too then, how did, how did Black women's relationship to labor change during this time period? I, um, since, they, since most of them were already obviously working outside of the home prior to the start of World War I. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I actually didn't find much in terms of the local context, um, unfortunately for that, but some of the contextual books I was reading talked about how um, women still were in the unskilled positions. A lot of the access we talk about for women entering some of those more skilled or for ladies or other sorts of training opportunities, a lot of those were still closed um, to African American women. And so I, my understanding is not much changed. Um, they still had the same type of access. Yeah. No, that's, that's helpful. Um, so one of our audience, well, we were getting a few different audience questions. And like I said, I'm hoping we'll get to them all, but I can't promise you. Um, so apologies in advance to our attendees who have questions. Um, so, you know, we know that 
the Grand Rapids Public Library and the work of the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council, folks have been digitizing these cards, at least in sort of for West Michigan. Um, do you know where else these cards can be accessed um, online? I think if I remember correctly, the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council website in the link that I dropped in the chat also includes so, some information about where those can be found, but I'm not entirely sure. Yes, they're in the, um, in the local history at the public library. Um, it's a collection that they have there so that it's a searchable um, database. I can I can see at the end if I, I can send the link specifically to that I should. Um, no, I guess my other question though is are the, what other cities may Oh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. No, it's okay. Yes, uh, that's a great question. Um, Grand Rapids has the most comprehensive we found. There is a city in Minnesota um, that found some and a city in Indiana. Um, I don't remember exactly which cities, unfortunately. And they, um, and there is some in Detroit as well uh, for some more of the state data, but none of okay. them have the same, have um, that we have 23,000, oh, nearly 23,000, which is a huge comprehensive collection. Yeah. No, yeah, definitely. No, that's, that's really helpful. Um, so then I guess just in terms of a little, if we're taking, I guess, a more macro view in terms of the role of women, uh, during World War I, um, if somebody wanted to research the role of women in nearby cities such as Holland, what kind of advice do you have? <laughs> yeah, which unfortunately, a lot of the research um, is still on site. And with COVID, access to that is a little tricky um, or by appointment. So um, and there are some, like the, the um, archives in Holland has really great stuff in the library um but you do need an appointment to access it um i always think looking at newspapers from the area or from the time too is so interesting i you could see it everywhere in the newspapers i looked for newspapers.com to um show some other cities um i found some stuff from kalamazoo on there and from grand haven they have those newspapers digitized um a lot of newspapers though are also microfilm and you still need to go look at them too. Um, so my advice is to stay tuned to COVID restrictions so you can go to archives in the local area where you want to learn more. <laughs> and some places yeah, yeah. are open too. So you just, you have to check with them, yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, did, so another audience question, did you see references to socialists politically in your research during World War One, specifically um, in regard to factories and labor? Yes, I did. Um, that is a great question. That was something that there were some newspaper articles that talked about. Um, a lot of it had, there was some scare for socialism. So I talked about some of the, um, the treatment of German workers and there were um, some issues with German and Kalamazoo there was an article about some um, German ethnic a group of men who were arrested um, because they were concerned that they weren't patriotic enough um, so that is some of the materials that you can you can see in the newspapers as well there was some fear about socialism permeating um, specifically into the women in industry I don't recall anything else specifically, um, just some general fear about uh, socialism and some highly reactive behavior towards um, things that could be considered socialist. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really helpful though, framing and thinking about how um, this alleged fear of socialism spreading was used um, in very punitive ways most of the time yeah. against, um, sort of ethnic whites uh, at the time who were sort of racialized as other um, because of the way in which um, whiteness was operating at the time, right? So thinking about um, when you had up that slide around non-whites, but thinking um, earlier in your presentation, right? Thinking about how um, so many um, ethnic groups that we would now consider to be white at the time weren't um, sort of categorized that way, mm -hmm. uh, just given the time period. Um, I, I'm being mindful of time and, uh, and other things, but I, 
what struck me was sort of the time in your presentation where you spent a little time talking about the role of overalls, mm -hmm. because I think a lot of time people don't necessarily reflect on how potentially how women dressed changed. Mm -hmm. um, and so were there any other kind of fashion changes being experienced um, in World War I, similar to the way in which overalls became adopted? And then what was that impact later on after the war? That is also a great question. Uh, one of the things you see on a smaller scale in World War I, as in World War II, is conservation of materials. Um, so there was there was some regular columns in the paper talking about food conservation, but also fabric conservation and making um, your garments in a way that freed up materials for war industrial production. Um, so there was even some printing patterns that were in the papers about how to um, be conscious of the fabric that you're using and also be stylish. In terms of after um, the war, I, I believe, from my understanding is as women retreated from industrial centers, um, things like overalls and uniforms were still were specific to women who stayed in those industries. So if women weren't staying in the industry, that kind of receded it until again, World War II, when they re-entered the factories, and that was the uniform you wear to be safe in the factory. <laughs> yeah. No, in terms of, um, when you think about 20s fashion, I haven't actually looked much past um, 1920 when the war ended. So I think that's a really great question for going forward. Um, yeah, what sort of permanent fashion changes happen based on what they experienced during the war? That's a great question. Um, so I guess um, my one of the, I guess as we're thinking about sort of your presentation, um, what's your next plan in terms of where where is this research going to take you? Like, what are you working on or? Yeah, um, ideally I would like to publish some sort of paper. Um, I'm not sure exactly where, where the format for that is. And as I've talked, um, initially for the women's cards, I had done a sampling um, for my paper. So I had entered the data in myself and done that with the library working on the metadata. Um, I want to spend some more time with that um, and rethink some of the conclusions I had drawn from my sampling. So this presentation was really helpful for getting that started, actually, because there's so much more um, that can be learned from the data from those cards. So I definitely want to dive deeper into that once the metadata is fully cleaned up and ready to go. Yeah. Well, I just want to thank you so much um, for your presentation, especially given the computer woes. I can't imagine sort of what that felt like um, sort of with a computer crashing. I think that's just everybody's worst nightmare. And I know we've all experienced probably our own set of technological snafus within the last year, uh, if we hadn't uh, prior to that. So I, I just want to thank you again um, for giving us such a wonderful presentation. Uh, when we do post uh, the video up on our YouTube channel um, later on this week, as well as our um, website, we'll also include the links uh, to the Women's Committee National Defense cards on our for the Grand Rapids Public Library digital collections. And then we'll also include that link um, to the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council website that also makes reference to those cards. I encourage folks, if you do have specific questions, about um, those cards or where you can access more of them. Maybe if you're interested in other regions outside of Grand Rapids to contact either the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council or uh, the local history uh, folks at the Grand Rapids Public Library. I'm sure folks there would uh, be really helpful, be really interested in helping you. Um, additionally, uh, we're really excited that Caitlin was able to help us close out our 12th annual local history roundtable. Uh, we do, the Coochie office does have another presentation though this Friday. It's part of our Grand Rapids Time Traveler series. And this Friday, um, if you're interested, you can check out our website for more details, including how to register. But on Friday, March 26th, uh, from 1030 to 1130, you can join us to learn more about local women's electoral history um, throughout the 1910s. Um, and so that presentation is going to be from uh, the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council's own Joellen Clary. So I'm really excited that 
Joellen will be able to join us. And again, that presentation is part of our Grand Rapids Time Traveler series. And then at the end of April, uh, we'll be joined by historian Karen Sieber on her research into the Omnibus College, uh, which is a traveling experiment in higher education. And she'll be discussing that um, in relationship to a greater West Michigan history. So thank you again for joining us, Caitlin. Uh, thank you to all of our attendees um, and enjoy the rest of your week. Bye.